Let's pray. Father, you have called us and we have come. We thank you that you've gathered us as your people. We pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts and the ears of our hearts and that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, the ninth chapter, beginning at the 51st verse. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead of him to a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, foxes have holes, and birds of the air have roosts, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he said, follow me. That man responded, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. You go proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go take leave of those at my house. Jesus told him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the word of the Lord. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands, and it stands forever. This passage is the hinge of the Gospel of Luke. Up to this point, Jesus has had a spectacularly successful ministry career. He's established himself as a teacher who speaks with authority. He's done spectacular miracles. You know, in our terms, he's got publishers lining up to offer him a book deal. You know, he's got a YouTube channel devoted to his sermons. You know, we've got seminaries bringing him in as a, uh, as a guest lecturer. Everything is rolling along beautifully. And then, instead of doing what any smart preacher would and capitalizing on his success and using uh, the momentum that he's built to take things to the next level, Jesus tossed it all aside. As Rich Mullins put it, he set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem. And from now on in Luke, all the way into chapter 19, what's commonly called the travel narrative, everything that happens, happens on the way to the cross. And with this turn, two things start to become clear. One... This begins to force others to make their own decision, either for Jesus or against him. Up to this point, that hasn't been necessary. And there have been huge crowds following Jesus, not because Jesus, but because, hey, free food, free miracles. It's the best show in town. You just can't beat it. But that's not the kind of follower that Jesus is looking for. And so we see here Jesus beginning to drive the wedge. It happens in various places in the Gospels. I believe in Matthew we see it actually at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. I think that's part of the purpose the sermon serves. You know, in John we see it in chapter 10. You know, in Luke we see it here. He's driving the wedge between those who are willing to follow him as Lord and those who aren't. 
He's forcing people to choose their side. And two, with this shift in Jesus' ministry, we begin to see more clearly what actually matters, what's actually important to him, what's important for his purpose. You know, and so we see right off the bat that cultural accommodation, that bending to the expectations of his culture is not anywhere on Jesus' agenda. Because at this point, he's in Galilee. He's heading for Jerusalem. In between the two is Samaria. And the Jews hated and despised the Samaritans, maybe even more than the Samaritans hated and despised them. These were half-breeds. They were heretics. You know, there'd been a history of conflict between the two. Um, You know, there had been incidents that, you know, in our day we would call terrorist. Uh, There was a lot of bad blood. And so it was not uncommon for, you know, good, respectable Jews to simply detour around Samaria. They would go into fully Gentile regions to avoid having to deal with those people. But... Jesus is not interested in taking the detour. He has set his face toward Jerusalem, and he is going the direct route. And what's more, not only does he not avoid the Samaritans, he doesn't reject them. In fact, he reaches out to them. He sends disciples on ahead to a Samaritan village seeking hospitality. But the first village to which they come rejects him. Why? Because he's not coming to them on their terms. A lot of the disagreement between Samaritans and Jews goes all the way back to the time of the kingdom being split uh, after the death of Solomon and the argument over where you're supposed to worship. Because Jeroboam, when he split the northern ten tribes off, didn't want his people going down to Jerusalem every year, so they built their own temple. And the Samaritans actually, to this day, remain uh, committed to that, the Samaritan church. Um, But Jesus is going to Jerusalem. He's not going to Mount Gerizim. He's not coming to them on their terms. He's not coming to them to support their agenda. And so they want no part of him. And Jesus doesn't argue with them. He doesn't call a press conference or put up a nasty post on Facebook. He doesn't feel the need to denounce them. In point of fact, he specifically avoids judgment because now is not the time for judgment. That comes later. He doesn't compromise with them. He doesn't try to reason with them. He doesn't try to find a middle ground. He simply lets them be. They do what they do. He stays focused on what he needs to be doing. He refuses to let their opposition divert him from what he's supposed to be on about. At the same time, Jesus is not going through this with tunnel vision. And it's real easy to get there, too. Yeah, I am so focused on this one thing that I am doing that anyone who comes along, anyone who needs anything from me, is an interruption. Jesus doesn't let the Samaritans sidetrack him. He doesn't let the people he meets by the side of the road sidetrack him, but at the same point, it's clear that they do matter. They matter very much. They aren't interruptions. They aren't in themselves distractions. They're part of the point and the purpose of his journey. They're part of what he's doing all this for. You know, as uh, Brian Stelk put it in a chapel sermon during my time at Regent, ministry is what happens when you're on the way to somewhere else. Now, that said, that doesn't mean that Jesus makes the encounter easy or comfortable for any of them. 
Far from it. The first, most basic, most difficult reality of discipleship is that Jesus is unreasonable on our terms. What he asks of us is unreasonable. Where he asks us to go in following him is unreasonable. And he doesn't pull any punches on that with those whom he meets. He intends, very deliberately, to leave each one who encounters him with only two choices, all or nothing. Either build your life entirely on Jesus or build somewhere else altogether. And in these three encounters, in verses 57 to 62, he makes this painfully clear. His message to the first man is that following Jesus means abandoning our minimum standards. This guy volunteers in grandiose terms. I will follow you wherever you go. No limits, no exceptions, no ifs, no buts, no fine print. Wherever you go, whatever you do, I will follow. Of course, remember, Jesus is the rising star. If he's heading to Jerusalem, a lot of the bystanders you get figured out to be thinking, you know, it must be that he is going to move to the hub of things. He's going to the center. He's out there to figure out where he wants to plant his megachurch. You know, this guy probably figures that he's going along to head the building committee, maybe lead the worship team. He does not have any idea that Jesus has his GPS, GPS set on the coordinates for Skull Hill. Do you think he'd be so eager if he knew? I kind of doubt it. And I doubt it in part because Jesus obviously does. He doesn't welcome this guy along. Instead, he says, you know, foxes have holes in the ground to go home to. The birds of the air, they have their roofs that they can land on to sleep at night. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. It's a powerful picture of poverty and rejection. Even the animals and the birds have some place to rest. But Jesus has nothing. You want to follow me, he says? Lay down your social position. Give up all assurance of comfort and safety. Trade everything you own for the uncomfortable and risky life of a vagabond. It's almost what he tells the rich young ruler, sell all you have and follow me. This at risk of sounding like a certain famous Sicilian, was inconceivable. <laughs> Truly it was. People were saying that this Jesus might be the long-awaited Messiah. How could the Messiah be a homeless man? What they didn't realize was that he had to be. And you know, for the reason that uh, Rich Mullins captured beautifully in his song, You Did Not Have a Home. If Jesus had had a home, a wife, a job, he would have been part of the system. The world would have owned a piece of him. It would have had leverage. But instead, he was outside the economic and political system. There were no handles for anyone to grab. That's why he gave the Pharisees such fits. The only thing the authorities could take from him was his life. And that was part of his plan. Jesus' powerlessness was essential to his power. K. 
can you imagine how this would-be volunteer responded to that? Well, you have to, because Luke doesn't tell us. He just dumps the question in our laps, leaves us to wrestle with it while he moves on. You may have observed this is a common pattern in the parables. Jesus liked doing this to us. So we're just, we're left to imagine. We're left to try to figure this out. Yeah, and it's easy to tell ourselves we aren't that guy. But if we stop and think about it, we really shouldn't be quite so sure about that. Because what was the problem with this man? It was nothing more than that he had his expectations of God. He had his expectations of what God should give him and what God could reasonably ask him to give up. And so do we, don't we? We have our sense of what God owes us, what we've earned, what's reasonable for him to ask. You know, this man tells Jesus, I will follow you wherever we go. So do we say. We just we sang that just a few minutes ago. And that is the commitment that he requires of us. But that means committing to follow him, even if it means giving up everything. Even if it means not getting the rewards that we're hoping for in the bargain. You know, if this life I lose is a very real possibility. For some people, it's been literally physically. But for an awful lot more of us, you know, it's the kind of life that we want to have. That we lay down, that we lose. To tell Jesus, I will follow you, means letting go of our fallback plans. Means operating without a net, hanging on for dear life, and accepting that we don't get to decide where we end up. I mean, we don't even get to decide how we get there. I mean, honestly, you know, as stubborn and willfully obtuse as a lot of us are, or at least I'm assuming I'm not the only one in the room, And again, amen, yeah. You know, we have to fall on our faces in gratitude every morning that God hasn't decided to give us the Jonah treatment and send us by fish. And if you hear that and say, you know, I think I am traveling by fish, you have my sympathy. I've been there. I know it's no fun. There's no first-class service on a fish. Just remember, you will get thrown up eventually. It's as fun as it sounds, but at least it gets you out. Now, whatever his warts, whatever his naivete, this first guy is at least a volunteer. We've got to give him credit for that. The second one isn't. He's a recruit. And what we don't see right off is that he's not really actually all that keen on the recruiter. I mean, his response sounds okay to our Western ears. This, this seems fair. It's like, okay, Jesus, I'll follow you, but you know, my dad's funeral is this afternoon. Once you get past the graveside service, I'll catch up. That's what it sounds like, but that's not actually what he's saying. And at this point, I need to kind of step back for just a moment and acknowledge one of the three or four, I think, most critical intellectual influences you know, in, uh, in my life, in my understanding of scripture, and uh, in the ministry that uh, God has called me to. And that's the Reverend Dr. Kenneth E. Bailey. I know some of you are uh, familiar with Dr. Bailey's work. For those who might not be, I'll just be ridiculously brief because that could be a lot longer than this sermon just telling you the story. Um, Dr. Bailey was a Presbyterian missionary and a New Testament scholar who spent decades writing about and teaching the Bible, mostly the Gospels, particularly the parables, it's where he really made his reputation, 
from inside a culture that I once heard him call the last generation of Jesus' day. It's very, very close to the culture out of which the New Testament came. Yeah, and for that reason, I believe that his, uh, his work is really indispensable if we want to kind of get out of our own frames of reference and get, you know, take off our you know, Western lenses and see the, the scriptures more clearly. And on this passage, he quotes an Egyptian Christian commentator uh, named Ibrahim Said, who writes, if his father had really died, why then was he not at that very moment keeping vigil over the body of his father? In reality, he intends to defer the matter of following Jesus to a distant future when his father dies as an old man. Yeah, Dr. Bailey adds in support of this that the phrase to bury one's father is a traditional idiom that refers specifically to the duty of the son to remain at home and care for his parents until they are laid to rest. And he notes many occasions, you know, during his uh, you know, time teaching in Lebanon and elsewhere around the Eastern Mediterranean, you know, hearing young men talking about wanting to emigrate, you know, to Europe or to America and being asked, will you not bury your father first? In other words, aren't you going to do your duty? Stick around and make sure that your parents are taken care of in their old age? You know, in other words, and we don't know how sincere he's being, obviously, but this man at least is speaking as a respectful son and a responsible member of society. Because remember, back then, retirement plans weren't called IRAs and 401ks. They were called children. If he defaults on his responsibility to care for his parents in their old age, what happens? Well, they die of neglect, unless what would actually happen, you know, the village comes along and takes on the responsibility of supporting them. Which then obviously makes everybody in the village a fair bit poorer for the, uh, you know, for the, the need to do that. And Jesus knows this. And his recruit knows that Jesus knows this. And so he tells Jesus, be reasonable. And Jesus says, I'm paraphrasing here. No. That's really the one word summary, summary of his response. The message to this man is that following Jesus means setting aside all the claims that society makes on us. It means denying society's expectations. Even knowing full well that if we do that, that's going to honk a lot of people off. And this is part of the subtext of this guy's response. Because if he goes off with Jesus, he's probably never going to be able to go home again. If he dumps his parents off on all of his friends and neighbors, they will forever after spit at the mention of his name. They will loathe and despise him for his selfishness and his irresponsibility. If he ever shows his face back in the village, they're probably going to throw things at him until he gives up and goes away again. And Jesus says, if you follow me instead of them, people will hate you for it. People that you care about will hate you for it. They will tell you that you must hate them if you're doing this. They'll do much worse than that to you. Let them. Follow me anyway. Well, okay, so that's cheerful. The third encounter builds on the themes of the first two. We kind of see both of these really distilled in this last one. Because this man presents himself as a volunteer, but he's a fraud. He's a fraud. He's a complete fraud. You see, while we usually translate his request as, let me go say goodbye, 
It's really kind of strange that, it's, that this particular verb is translated that way here because it isn't anywhere else in the New Testament. What he actually says, and it's rendered faithfully on every other occasion, is let me take leave. So you say, okay, well, why does that matter? Well, you got to understand the culture of the Near East, from that time all the way up to this. It was the one who was leaving who would ask permission to go, and that was taking leave. Those who stayed were the ones who would say goodbye. So, for instance, you're at a dinner, and it's late, you're tired, you want to go home. You would say to your host, with your permission, and they would respond, God go with you, or may you go in peace, or something of that nature. So this guy is not saying, okay, Jesus, I'm happy to follow you. Let me just go home, give my mom a kiss, shake my dad's hand. No, 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 no. He's saying, I'll follow you, Lord, just as soon as I go home and get permission from my parents, who, of course, will refuse to allow him to do any such crazy thing. Who does he think he is anyway? So he can claim that he wants to follow Jesus without actually having to do anything as inconvenient and disruptive as, you know, actually following Jesus. He wants the credit without the work, to be blunt. But, I mean, from his point of view, obviously his father's authority over him is higher than Jesus' authority. Of course, if he's going to follow Jesus, he has to have his father's permission first. It's perfectly reasonable. Perfectly good scam. And Jesus responds with a brief parable. And to understand this, you need to know that plowing in that time and place actually took place four times over over the course of the year. It was a repeated process, season by season. And it was done with a very light, one-handed wooden plow. And... With the right hand, you held the goad to keep the oxen moving. The left, you know, kept the plow upright, held it at the proper depth, lifted over stones in the field, and above all else, kept it straight. And this took careful attention and skill, lest the plow catch on a rock and break, or, you know, cut back into previously plowed ground, destroying work that had already been done, or veer the other way, making the next furrows more difficult. A mistake could damage the field's drainage, or leave seeds exposed for birds to eat, or destroy a valuable tool. Plowing required intense focus to work in harmony with the oxen and with the work that had already been done, and with the work that remained to be done. A distracted plowman could not maintain this harmony, and in fact, could destroy it, ruining an entire year's work. Would not be any wiser than going down the freeway at 70 miles an hour and turning around to have a conversation you know, with, uh, with, with, with your kid in the car seat. Granted, you'd wind up less dead with a plow, but still, the point holds. Jesus' point here is very clear. Following Jesus means following only Jesus. He's calling for a single-minded, single-hearted commitment with a single focus. For what we see in the Beatitudes and in James 4, called being pure in heart. You know, Soren Kierkegaard has it, purity of heart is to will one thing. That's what he's calling for, is willing one thing and following him. He's calling his disciples to be all in. And you know, as a lifelong Seattle sports fan, sort of, you know, washed up in the Midwest, uh, strange waves, like I say, you can never tell where God's going to take you. I can tell you that, you know, my, uh, my Seahawks 
over the last number of years have presented something of an acted parable on the importance of being all in. That's been Pete Carroll's rallying cry ever since he took over the franchise nine years ago. And in 2013, the team was all in. And they won the Super Bowl. Over the years, as that commitment fractured and splintered, they went from Super Bowl champions to Super Bowl losers to out of the playoffs altogether, then to the point of dumping half their best players, taking a severe hit in talent to try to make it possible to rebuild the commitment. <laughs> because they were better off being less talented, but all on the same page, than being where they were at that point. If being single-minded and single-hearted matters in football, how much more in following Jesus? And how much more justification? How much more reason are we given? Because the basis for that singular commitment is Jesus' demand that we accept him as the only authority in our lives. In that culture, the clash we see is with parental authority, which is absolute. Family authority was of ultimate importance. You might even go so far as to say that in that culture, calling God Father was giving him a promotion. You know, so that's where we see the challenge come with this supposed volunteer. You know, Dr. Bailey recalls from his seminary days in Beirut, a class of Middle Eastern students hearing this passage preach and turning pale when they realized that Jesus was actually claiming an authority greater than their fathers. That's how shocking and disturbing an idea that was. Now, our society, that's not so much the thing. The world around us looks to other authorities. You know, if there's any that our culture would regard with that same sort of, you know, absolute view, it would probably be the authority of desire, especially sexual desire, yeah, which our culture understands is basically determining our identity. We are what we want, as you might say. There are others. Yeah, the authority of our political tribes, our red tribe and our blue tribe, is right up there. We could go on. And whatever we might come up with, Jesus pulls rank on all of them. There's no room for divided loyalties in the kingdom of God. There are no other authorities with which he's willing to compromise, for which he'll make allowances. There's nobody else that he'll say, you can follow them on this point, just follow me on the rest. Uh-uh. Wherever you go, whatever you do, that's what he has in mind. Yeah, if we say, Jesus, I'll follow you, but not that far, I'd lose my job and go broke. He says, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. You follow me. If we say, Jesus, I'll follow you, but you have to be reasonable. If you ask me to do that, my parents will never speak to me again. I'll offend all my family and lose all my friends. He says, let the dead bury their own dead. You go proclaim the kingdom of God. If we say, Jesus, I'll follow you, but there's this one thing I'm not going to let go of. I'm not going to lay down this desire or this plan or this relationship, and you'll just have to be okay with that. He says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And that's hard. It's really hard. And to our world, it sounds unjust, unloving, unreasonable, certainly, even cruel. But we need to remember that Jesus doesn't say this because he wants to deprive us of something. We need to remember that the one who calls us is the one who calls himself the good shepherd. 
And we need to think about what that means. We tend to want to treat following Jesus as a bargain. I'll follow you if, fill in the blank. You know, if I get the relationship I want, if I get the job I want, if I get the career I want, you know, if this, if that, if the other thing, and a lot of those other things are very good. Yeah, my parents are in their 70s. My mother's health has been uh, swirling steadily for uh, 20 years and more. I worry about them. And I worry about what happens when the next major thing goes wrong. And I would love to be able to be closer to them, to be able to help support them. My mom can't travel very much. She doesn't see our kids much. And I feel guilty about that. But I didn't get any say in the matter, ultimately. He doesn't call us to follow him if. He calls us to follow him regardless. He is the shepherd. He calls us to follow him like sheep. Sheep are radical followers. They don't try to navigate or ask to take side trips. They don't complain about what pasture they're led to. I don't like this grass. I want that grass over there. They don't argue about what water source they get. Yeah. They don't insist that, no, this is not food. I want something else. Sheep trust that where and how the shepherd leads them is what's best for them. Even when that means going through canyons so narrow and so steep-sided that the sun never reaches the bottom except at noon. They trust the shepherd to want what's best for them and to know what is best for them better than they do. Two things with which I think we have very severe trouble much of the time. And because they trust, they follow wherever he leads. Jesus wants us to trust him like sheep. Is he good? Yes. Is it hard? Yes. But he is good. Will we suffer? Yes, sometimes. But he is good. Will the road be dark? Yes, for a while. And then no doubt again. But he is good. Will we get what we want out of life? Maybe not. But he is good. Will we face trials? Yes. But he is good. Will we suffer defeats and failures? Yes, many. But he is good. Will we have to walk the road alone? Never. Because he is good. His demand that we follow him alone because he is God is at bottom an invitation to trust him above all others because he is good. However hard things may have been, he's never failed us yet. And however hard they may yet get, he never will because he is good. Let's pray. Jesus, you have called us, and we're here, trying to follow you as best we can. Please keep our eyes and our hearts on you. Please teach us to follow. And please teach us to trust you for your patience and your grace. You know it's hard. 
and that through it all, you're with us. Thank you. Amen.